Inspector, the session is live and you are live on YouTube. Right, uh, thank you. I can see uh, Mr. Goodwin's with us, so I'll resume the inquiry. So, yes, yeah. sorry, um, I, I, we, we only just lost you, so um, you were reading out the evidence and as far as I got to, you were saying about in paragraph 9.8, you were about um, halfway down. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I think, good, Mr. Goodwin, why don't you read from concentrating on the word scale? Yeah, okay. I do apologize. So, we had a power cut, so it took everybody's things down. Oh, oh right. Oh, wow. Um, but the generator on the estate is now on, so it shouldn't happen again. So, my apologies. Again. I hope you're not peddling. No, I'm not, <laughs> Mr. White. Um, concentrating on the word scale as set out in the reason for refusal, it must be recognised that the significant reduction in the number of units and in turn generated public pressure footfall would result in a corresponding significant reduction and dispersal of pressure across the site. As such, the BNG measures being proposed would in fact be far more likely to be successful compared to the previous scheme and to conclude otherwise would be illogical. This is dealt with in more detail within section six and seven of my proof of evidence. Thank you. Could we then go to 911 and the first sentence? It's the first point I want to ask you additionally about, and you note a full suite of updated protected species surveys were undertaken during 2021. Yep. Uh, and you also identify 9.9 that the appeal site has been subject to surveys since 2016-19 by EPR, who I think were the previous ecological consultants, and then by your firm in 2021. So I just want to ask you broadly, um, we've obviously had the evidence of the council and their satisfaction that the information is satisfactory. One of, one of the repeated worries of third parties is a concern about the information that exists. So I just want to give you an opportunity to comment on what you say about the material that now lies before this inspector and its adequacy or not. Okay. Um, I think in terms of adequacy, um, it isn't just a snapshot because we've obviously got survey information that went back to 2016. Um, so it's actually a very good baseline. I think the misunderstanding from third parties, and, it, and it's a fair misunderstanding, um, because you, I tend to see it quite a lot. And that is, there's this belief that if you have a species list, that is what gives you value to a site. Um, so the more things you can have on that list or the longer the list, the more valuable the site must be. But let me give you an example, sir. If you've got field A and field B, and field A has got 100 species in it, but it's only got one individual of each of those species. But field B has got exactly the same 100 species, but it's got 1,000 individuals. Which is the better site? Obviously, the one that has the majority. It's got the same species list. And because you've got a better distribution and a bigger population of those things, that goes towards the merits for how valuable a site is. So I think often there's a misunderstanding that um, it, it's a, about a list. So you'll see a lot of the third parties talk about that there's 11 uh, indicators of unimproved pasture. Indeed, there is 11 indicators, but they're actually so scattered. Um, we added to that list with two particular species pig nut and adder's tongue, but they only occur on that 24 hectare site in two very small locations. So that's how you build up value. And I think third parties sometimes don't understand that. The other thing is that surveys have to be replicable. They've got to follow a methodology um, because obviously you could bias the situation with time. If I spent 24 hours surveying a site, and, and another site only spent 20 minutes, but they were the same 10 hectare site. The list is gonna be bigger because I've spent more time on, on the first one. So again, 
it's about survey effort. So all surveys and methodologies are set out so that you can repeat them at the next site, at the next site, at the next site. So as a professional ecologist, you start to build up a picture of what's of quality and what isn't of quality. So again, I, I think that's a, a misunderstanding. Um, the only other one I would say, because um, it's quoted so often, is this idea of the red list of birds of concern. Yes, if a species is listed as red on that list, it needs to be taken into account. But to give you an example, you might have something like bitten, where we might only have a handful of pears in the UK, which are on the red list, but you might have house sparrow, which is also on the red list, but that still a, has a population in its millions. So again, it's not just the fact of uh, it being a red listed bird. Why is it there? And what are the factors that you have to take into account? So I think on surveys, there's just this general misunderstanding for, for third parties. Um, which I fully appreciate and understand, but it is very different from how a professional uh, reviews that information and uses it. Now, can I ask you, in the light of the information that you have, is it your view that the evidence relating to surveys is adequate or not to consider the current ecological value of the site? Absolutely adequate. I mean, it's better than adequate. As I say, the, the information is going back over several years. Um, so, yes, absolutely. And is that a view that you've just expressed that you, you believe is endorsed or rebutted by Kent County Council and Ashford Borough Council? It's endorsed by them. Um, that's very clear from the Statement of Common Ground and from my discussions and indeed from what Ms Forster said today. Now, can I just go, because it was raised in, in Ms Forster's re-examination, can I just go to your proof at 536 and 537? Please. Yeah. Yes. And Ms. Forster gave direct evidence. I just want to ask you about, you concluded when you wrote your proof that all of the habitats within the appeal site are of relatively limited value. And then you go on to expand on that. And you also set 537 in terms of faunal species, the appeal site is neither unique nor important. In the light of Ms. Forster's evidence, do you want to make any comment about those conclusions in your written proof or not? Um, I don't want to make any comments other than just to confirm with the inspector, I still hold to those views. Um, the information that's in front of the inquiry clearly demonstrates. So, for instance, um, let's take the grasslands, because that seems to be the biggest point between us um, later on in terms of uh, uh, implementing things. But the grasslands are not unimproved grasslands. And that's something that third parties, um, I think even the Kent Wildlife Trust has said, well, aren't these unimproved meadows? No, the data shows that actually they're relatively poor. And I've agreed that in the statement of common ground, that the herb species within that grassland are few and far between. And it's the herb species that make up the key value to a grassland. Yes, you've got to look at the grassland species, you take those into account, but here we've got species, we've got semi-improved neutral grassland that is species poor in terms of its uh, numbers and distribution of those key flowering plants, because that, that's what forbs or herbs are, it's the broad leaved element. Um, so no, I stand by absolutely what I've written in 536 and 537. Thank you. Now, before we come on to consider what is proposed, can I just spend a moment at 9.16 and 9.17 about let's help assist the inspector on how to judge what is proposed against um, the provisions, both provisions that are emerging in law and policy. How, how, in essence, do you say it would be right for the inspector to judge what is proposed in terms of biodiversity? Um, well, let's just start getting the, the sort of, I suppose, the facts in, in place. The Environment Act is, is here, um, but the mandatory 10% requirement won't come into effect until the Secretary of State publishes additional regulations to go along with the Act. That's uh, not anticipated uh, for probably the next two years. 
um, part of that is already out on, on consultation. So at the moment, we don't have any mandatory requirement. Um, there's no local policy that sets a percentage. And the MPPF, while it's very clear in looking for gains, again, it sets no percentage. So as far as I'm concerned, if a scheme delivers a something better than neutral, let's call it 1%, then that would comply with policy. Uh, and I think that is what the inspector should be making the judgment against. Thank you. Then let's look at 920 and see, making that judgment, what tool we employ. And could you just read out 920, which is introduced version 3.0? Version three of the metric, was launched on, on the 7th of July 2021. Prior to its launch, it was stated on the Natural England website that, and this is what the quote was, it will be this metric that underpins the Environment Bill's provisions for mandatory net gain in England, subject to any necessary adjustments for application to major infrastructure projects. Thank you. And then 922, please. However, it's important to recognise that the use of the metric does not take into account all factors. And actually, I'll just interject there. So, so, protected species, for instance, are not something that the metric can take into account. So if you are increasing GCN, great crested youth population, from 50 to 200, the metric can't deal with that. So you don't score anything for actually doing any benefit for protected species. Equally, it can't take into account connectivity. Um, mosaic, mm, it even struggles to do that in a, in a meaningful way. So there are things within the metric that may be enhancements on a scheme, indeed on this one, that can't be taken into account. So um, it can't take into account all factors which are relevant to ecology and nature conservation matters. Indeed, I note that this is explicitly stated in paragraph 1.8 of the user guide for the metric. And it says there, the metric is not a substitute for expert ecological advice. It's a tool, sir. It's a tool to help us, but it's one tool, but it does give us a measure. And that's the, the key thing about it. Um, rather than ecologists arguing about subjective uh, words, then this tries at least to put in place a mathematical model to get you to something that's measurable. And I think just in 923, you confirm that the BNG assessment, that the latest BNG assessment is a, your effectively your appendix one and is dated 2022, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then at 924, could you just, could you just in the light of the cross-examination of Ms. Forster, could you just, read 924 out, but also just walk the inspector through the table, please. Yep. Um, as set out within the most recent net gain assessment, I've calculated the proposals to deliver a significant net gain to biodiversity. As extracted from section four of the net gain assessment, the following headline results can be achieved. And then I've set that out in the table. So let's deal with the uncontroversial uh, ones first. Uh, linear and water courses, obviously huge gains there, um, you know, plus 52, plus 44. Um, so that's uh, in terms of linear features. And, and along with linear features, remember, goes all the, the, the species um, uh, things that go with that. So bats using linear features, um, great crested newts using the bottom of hedgerows. Um, so you have to look at it in a broader yeah. sense well as just the metric. And then um, the one where the controversy, I suppose, or the disagreement, at least on the implementation and management, is the area. Um, and you'll see there the baseline units and the post-development results. The, the way I describe it, and it's probably very simplistic, uh, and perhaps shows part of my age, is I often think of it as just the old fashioned scales on one side, you've got what you've already got and you're adding things in at the other side. Um, and when you tip the scales, then you go past the, the, the sort of neutral point and into positive territory. Um, 
But the baseline results is quite important, obviously, because where you set the baseline will influence then what the gain is. So that's why it's so important to not only make those judgments correctly, but actually justify those in terms of how you reach those particular conclusions. Um, and I don't know whether Mr. White is probably going to take me to it later, but within that uh, uh, first appendix, it sets out a clear justification for each of the decisions that I've taken in terms of the habitats and in terms of their condition. Well, let, let's deal with that, please, Mr. Goodwin, before we go on and look, look in detail at, at the, the, how you've effectively got the improvements. Let, let's just deal, because the Kent Wildlife Trust have a concern about the existing and the classification in particular of the grassland and that generally you've undervalued the condition of the habitat. Can you just, could I just ask you to consider the baseline and you might want to make reference to the UK habitat classification and the guidance on biodiversity metric free, just to illustrate your point to the inspector's benefit, please. Yep, that's fine. So these were the CDs that have just gone in, I think. So they're CD 8.44 and 45, sir. I think they've just been added. So the extract I put in, because the document is, is absolutely huge, um, just to get you orientated, ecologists have spent their entire lives um, using two methods, um, phase one habitat surveys, which everybody is used to, and MVC, National Vegetation Classification. And that's a sort of community. You're looking at the actual community in detail. Now, don't ask me why, but the people um, who are obviously far more intelligent than me, uh, when they were coming up with the metric, decided that they would... Um, have a completely different classification system. So the very first thing that an ecologist has to do after you've surveyed the site um, is then actually do the conversion from your phase one or MVC surveys into UK HABS codes, because it's those codes that you fit in the metric. So what I've extracted for you um, to give you as an example is the grassland one because that's the one that creates the problem. So I think you've got the, the front page, sir, and then I think you've got the next page is section one, primary habitats. And the third page you should have, it starts with a little G and it says grassland. Yes. Yep. Yes. I okay, that. so that's the first stage. So all that's really doing, it's very simple, it's actually saying to you, what's the habitat you're dealing with? Well, we're dealing with, we're dealing with grassland. Um, turn on, we know we're not dealing with acid grassland. We know we're not dealing with lowland dry acid grassland or inland dunes or other lowland acidic grassland or upland or montane. You can flick through all of those pages and eventually you will come to after all the calcare stuff, you'll come to neutral grassland. So this is the next, the next stage. So we know we've got neutral grassland here, not only from the soils, but from the species that, that exist. So most ecologists could go to a site and tell you whether it's acid grassland, neutral grassland or calcareous. Um, so here we've got neutral grassland. And what it says here in the definition is, Vegetation dominated by grasses and herbs on a range of neutral soils, usually with pH of between 4.5 and 6.5. That's exactly what we've got. Then if you go down to the species, it says neutral grassland communities have few diagnostic indicator species, but lack strong calcifold or calcifuges. That's just um, calcareous or, or acidic, um, just posh names for it characteristic of the base rich and acid soils respectively. Now here's, a, here's the important bit. Neutral grassland differs from agriculturally improved grassland, and the code for that is G4, by having a less lush sward, a greater range and higher cover of herbs, and usually 
less than 25% cover of perennial ryegrass. So the key there is um, this greater range and a higher cover of herbs. But we know from the survey information that the herbs are actually relatively few and far between. So if we turn over and we look at unimproved, so this is what some of the third parties and the Kent Wildlife Trust think the site is, all those grasslands are. Let's just look at that. And it says lowland neutral meadows and pastures consist of a rich mis mixture of native grasses and broad leaved herbs. Um, and then if you look at the next bit, it says uh, on that second line, um, and this is the key, has not been substantially modified. Well, we know something has happened to this site because we've got unimproved um, indicator species, but they're only dotted about as remnants. So something has happened to this site to cause that. Now, it could either be overgrazing, but I don't think that's the case here, or at some point in the past, it's had a selective herbicide, which has removed all of the broad-leaved plants, a bit like anybody at home, if they've got a lawn and they want to get rid of the daisy, you don't use a general herbicide because it would wipe out your lawn. You use a selective one. It just takes out all the broad-leaved species. So we, we know it can't be only improved lowland meadow, G3A is the code. It can't be that because we don't have this rich mixture across its entire um, uh, community. So if you turn on again, we're not lowland hay meadow, and we're not upland hay, hay meadow, but eventually you'll come to other neutral grassland. Now, again, looking at the definition neutral grass and that does not meet the definition of G3A. So it, it wasn't unimproved, so it didn't meet that definition. So where is it now? Well, if you carry on reading, it talks about there being nine to 15 further species per metre squared. Well, again, we don't really have that because the distribution is much, much lower. Um, and it goes on to say many of the more species rich swords that were previously described as semi-improved neutral grassland will fall here together with rank and unmanaged swords on neutral soils. So in truth, we don't really fit that. And if you go down to the exclusion, it says species poor swords, which is what we've got, previously described as semi-improved neutral grassland CG4. So you have to turn over the page, several pages, um, and you'll eventually come to G4. And I think it's the last, yes, it's the last page I've, I've given you as the extract. And this says modified grasslands. And it says vegetation dominated by a few fast growing grasses on fertile neutral soils. And if we go down into the species, it lists some of the grass species. And then it says, grass cover, usually over 75%. Well, all of these meadows, the grasslands element of it are 75 or above. And there's, there's no doubt about that um, because in some of the fields, the grass element of it is 80, 90 and above. So, what you would normally do is you'd then say, well, all of these, these grasslands are modified. Now that's what EPR did. And I can understand exactly why they did that because they would have followed the procedure I've just taken you through. Now modified grassland is a really poor um, grassland. It wouldn't score very well on the metric um, because it's not really got a lot of interest. Now, a lot of the consultees wrote in and said, we think you've underestimated that EPR when you were doing your work um, because you haven't taken account of X, Y, and Z. Now I've looked at the consultation responses. Um, I wasn't persuaded by all of their argument, but what I was persuaded by, sir, was that the grass element, those grass species, are actually quite diverse. So I felt that I needed to take account of that in the metric. 
So rather than sticking with modified grassland, which would have actually boosted the BNG score, I took a more conservative approach and said, well, actually, I'm going to go back several pages to that G3C other neutral grassland that we just looked at. And that, that would score higher on the baseline, therefore making it harder to get the gain. So I've been very precautionary in my approach, because although I've been able to demonstrate to you it does fit modified, I've actually taken a backward step and I've allocated something that's slightly better than perhaps what I should have done. So I've taken on board all of those considerations. So I hope for those third parties who think that somehow I've underestimated uh, the community on this site, if anything, I've slightly over um, cooked the books, so to speak, in terms of I've gone for a, I've gone for a community that really went it isn't the right one. I've given it a higher score as the baseline. Um, so that's a disadvantage to the percentage gain because we start from a, a higher point. So I hope that's, I know it's quite complicated, but I hope that's explained how ecologists work through those conversion tables and what I did in this particular instance. Now, the other extract that I put in and I think I just put in a couple of, uh, couple of examples. This is another part of the metric, because once you've identified what your community is through those HABS codes, you then have to decide what condition it's in. So if you look at the sheet I've given you at the top, it should say condition sheet, grassland habitat types. Mm. Uh, GD 8.45. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've got, I've got a condition sheet, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So you see there at the top, there's a list of different grasslands. Roughly in the middle, you'll see grassland, other neutral grasslands. So that's how I've, that's what we've just looked at and where I've actually put the community. Um, now, you then go on to the condition assessment criteria. So the first one is the appearance and composition of the vegetation closely matches the characteristics of the specific grassland habitat type, see UK HABS codes, wildflowers, sedges and indicator species for the specific grassland habitat type are very clearly and easily visible throughout the sward. So it's a fail. It doesn't pass that test, it fails it. Next one, sward height is varied. Well, again, it failed that test because when it's been grazed, it's all been grazed uniformly and it's all short. Um, cover of bare ground, does it fall between one and 5%? No, it fails that test. Cover of bracken, less than 20%. Yes, it passes that. Um, and then the last one, there is an absence of invasive non-native species um, combined cover of undesirable species such as, you know, creeping thistle or broadleaf dot, they would be the und undesirables. They're actually listed at the bottom in that footnote for you. Um, is there less than, than um, required? And what I've put is, yes, you pass that uh, on balance. There are some fields where those, uh, what we would all term weeds, um, probably do go above that 5%. Um, but overall, I've said that it passes. So that means it fails three of the conditions and it passes two of them. And then you go into the condition assessment result and you'll see there um, passes five of five, it's in good condition, a three or a four or a five, it's moderate. But if it didn't pass any or it only passed one or two, which is the case here, then it's in poor condition. And that's how you then add that to the metric. So it isn't just the community, it's the condition you assign to it. Now you can do exactly the same for every single habitat on this site. Um, so that's an explanation, I hope, that should put to bed that 
Uh, I think there's been quite a strong accusation that the appellants have underestimated um, or they've said something's in poor condition and we think it's in better condition. Um, the problem for me, sir, is I don't have a metric from anyone else um, with any justification. So I can look at it and say, well, actually, OK, I agree with you on that point, but I disagree with you on another. The only metric that's in front of the inquiry is the one that I've produced. Um, so I hope, I hope, sir, that clears up some of those concerns about either the wrong classification or the fact that we've undervalued the condition of the site. Yes, yeah, so this is the baseline anyway, isn't it? And, and it's not the council as such that the, well, the council's witness did not um, object or, or um, oppose the baseline survey, did they? So, so this is really reply, responding to the other parties that have, have indicated, Absolutely. which includes Kent Wildlife Trust consultancy. I'd like to emphasise that, that I don't think it's the Kent Wildlife Trust as such. It's the, it's the consultancy that's been employed by Tenterton Town Council Absolutely. to advise they, they, Tenterton Town Council. I think Mr. Coombs emphasised that, that it's the consultancy rather than the actual trust itself. But anyway, just wanted to sort of emphasise that. But, no, you're, but, you're correct, sir. It's the consultancy mm -hmm. arm. Um, but yes, yeah. this dealt more with the third parties raising those issues. And I thought yeah. Yeah, it was a helpful... Oh, way. no, no, that's been very helpful. Thank you very much. That's, that's helped me as well to, to understand it in, in a bit more detail. Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, can we then go to your appendix and look, can we go to page 35 and page 42? Let's go into the future and the application of the biodiversity net gain. And am I right? Page 35 is effectively Eco4 enhanced habitats. Yes, that's correct. And am I right in thinking this, this is effectively um, the application of your judgment to the criteria as what is proposed effectively within the LEMP, if planning permission is granted, what will effectively be the consequence of the grant? And that's your classification of what is proposed. Is that right or not? It, it is right, Mr. White, but, you, but there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. And I, I don't know whether Ms. Forster just missed it, whether she doesn't quite understand the metric, um, but if you turn, so I can just show it this way. If you turn to, it's paginated page 16. So in your appendices. In my appendices. So yeah. same appendix, but just turn back. 16 or 60. 16, Sorry. 1, 6, sir. Yeah, One thank six. You, Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It should start for biodiversity net gain assessment results. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, that's right. So if I just explain to you, this is the baseline again, but it has influences um, when we come on past the baseline. So just to get you orientated, this first part is the baseline. So I put in other neutral grassland. I've put it fairly poor. So I didn't actually, although that we just went through the condition assessment and it comes out as poor, Ecologists are allowed under the metric to have these divisions. So you've got poor, moderate and good, but you're allowed to say, well, do you know what? I don't think it's poor, poor. So I'm going to call it fairly poor. And you put a piece in between. And the same with, with moderate or good, you can say it's fairly good. So that allows you to make that professional judgment. So again, I've erred on the precautionary basis Rather than calling it poor, I've called it fairly poor. And by doing so, it increases the value of the baseline. So once again, I'm building in a precautionary element to it. Now, if you turn over a couple of pages um, to page 19, 1, 9, you get there the, the habitats that we're going to create. And again, it lists them all. It tells you what the hectareage is. It tells you what the target condition is that we're going to look for. But I want you to turn the next page, which is the enhancements. 
And the reason, Mr. White, I was saying that it isn't just um, that plan eco thought, but it's worthwhile having your finger in it. Um, well, in fact, let's just go back to it. You'll see that the grassland in the country park is that sort of greeny color mm -hmm. and the neutral grassland that's within and around the different parcels of development is also green. And Miss Forster spent an awful long time in evidence in chief and in re-examination talking about, oh, well, it would be so difficult to manage. I think she used the word slithers on a number of occasions. So let's just see what we did in terms of the justification. So, if you turn to that page 20, which is the enhancement section, what we've said there is other neutral grasslands, you'll see it's 7.91, fairly, fairly poor, and we think we can get it to good condition. And then it's got all of the information as to why I took that decision. But if you follow the table down and you get to three, it says other neutral grassland, 2.46, fairly poor to fairly good. So we didn't go all the way to good. And the justification is in the text. Enhanced areas of fairly poor condition, green infrastructure grassland, management will be the same as prescribed for the country park and good condition will be targeted. However, on a precautionary basis, a target condition of fairly good has been applied. And the reason I've applied it is because they are smaller areas. They will be more difficult to manage. And some of the concerns that uh, Ms. Forster put forward, um, I don't disagree with. But where I disagree is I've already taken account of that in the metric. So I've scored that as only reaching fairly good rather than go good, which I've got for the country park. So that would reduce the benefit, if you want to put it that way, and therefore reduces the score. So when Ms. Forster spent a long time talking about, oh, well, I don't believe it could be implemented, it would be so much harder, the metric itself because of the choices I've made, the metric has already taken that into account. If, if we wanted to play it the other way, then I could call the grassland in and around the development reaching good condition, which would push the score up from just short of 15, probably up to 18. And then we take account of uh, his forces concerns to bring it back to 14. The metric has already done that. It was there. All you had to do was look at these tables and read the justification. And obviously, this was provided in my proof. Ms. Forster asked for the Excel spreadsheets, which means that she can interrogate the actual sheets and change the calculations insofar as you can. And she had a complete justification for why I'd chosen the condition assessments and the classification. Why she didn't take that on board, I don't know but her concerns have already been dealt with as part of this metric. Now, can I then just, just go back to effectively 35, and I just want to go to 42, because as I understand it, 42 is effectively where you get the, the material that you populate your table one on page 69. Is that right or not? Yes, that's correct. Um, and just before anyone asks, because I think I might as well deal with it here while we're, we're here. Um, you'll see there, um, yes, quite correctly, Mr. Uh, Mr. White, you've got your habitat units, you've got your hedgerow units, and you've got your river units. River is a broad term, which mm. just means wetlands, linear features. Um, and then you come down to the percentage changes. But right at the very bottom, just in case anyone's got a concern, uh, no check trading summary, because it says trading rules satisfied. And sometimes the metric will throw out this, no, it's not been, if the trading rules haven't been satisfied. Sometimes that indicates you've done something wrong in the metric, but I know why it did it on this occasion. So the Wildlife Trust, sorry, the consultancy arm of the Wildlife Trust 
were very concerned that there was a small piece of woodland that got cleared from the site and they make it very plain in their consultation response that when we were doing the metric they wanted us to pretend that the woodland is back and they talk about the you know it was trashing the site uh, and, and they do use that word several times first of all as i understood it that little small piece of woodland was cleared with with the local authorities um, request or permission um, but actually if i put the woodland back it will boost the score and the reason is that a cleared woodland you can't assign the condition um, the, the metric puts it in instantly as high so i've left it as cleared because that reduces the score so although the, 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 the consultancy arm of the wildlife trust asked me to add it back in it would actually make the percentage gain even greater um, it's just one of those peculiarities that you have to really understand the metric to understand you know what you're doing with it so because i've done that it happened to throw out this no trading rules not satisfied and that is the reason so i just wanted to clarify that but again it does illustrate sir that you can get completely the wrong end of the stick with the metric oh, your client took out the woodland, we need you to add it back in. Well, if I, as I say, if I add it back in, the score goes up. Um, so I've actually left it in as cleared. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Goodwin. Now, sir, in the interest of time, I won't ask Mr Goodwin to explain 43 to 51, which is the detailed outputs and the assessment of the different units and what they're comprised of, unless, sir, uh, you would find it a benefit for Mr Goodwin to do that exercise. Uh, no, no, I don't think that will. Okay, be good. No, Fine. Well, then, Mr. Goodwin, in view, in view of, um, of that, let's then go on, please. And can I just ask, in relation, please, to could you go back to your proof and can we take up, please, paragraph 9.29? And could you read from 9.29 to 9.33, please? Yeah. Uh, given the scale of residential units, in my experience, it would be difficult to envisage many development proposals providing some 8.66 hectares of country park and 7 hectares of green infrastructure. In those terms, I believe the appeal proposals are exemplary. They set a benchmark for the quantum of green space and ecological enhancement provision when compared to other development. Turning specifically to reason for refusal five, this alleges that it's the delivery of the mitigation enhancements which is being questioned. Yet ABC provide no evidence as to why they hold this view. Indeed, ABC put their concerns no higher than would be unlikely to be able to be successfully implemented. And I know of no evidence that would lead me to support that conclusion. There is nothing unique about the appeal site which would lead an ecologist to conclude that these simple ecological measures for the creation and enhancement of grassland, for example, are likely to fail. The planting of new hedgerows or the bolstering of existing ones takes place up and down the country. Indeed, I suspect that ABC seeks such measures on the majority of development sites that come before them. Similarly, the construction and planting of new wetland features are straightforward to create using standard techniques. Let's just we we know, let me just ask, we know that effectively the concern doesn't relate to the linear calculation or the watercourse calculation. Very much the focus is on the area calculation. And I just want to ask you about that. Now you've heard from Mrs. Forster, Ms. Forster about those. I, I want to ask you a series of questions about that. And of course, the first, and I think the principal concern related to the recreational pressure that as a result of of what people will do in future in some way that will preclude or impact the level of gain that you've identified. What, what do you say to that? Okay, well, firstly, in relation to recreational pressure on those areas outside of the country park, I've just explained that's all taken, part, uh, taken care of within the metric itself. In terms of the country park, um, recreation and ecology are not something that are mutually exclusive. Um, I can't think of many sites, whether they be national nature reserves or triple SIs, and certainly local wildlife sites, that don't have to reconcile ecological management 
with recreational management. But even if I accepted what Ms. Forster is saying, and I don't think she put it any, any, any more strongly than, oh, well, if they created paths and we said that they were a metre wide and they make them two metres wide, and then, you know, you measure that. If you measured that in terms of the metric, um, it would be quite difficult to do. This is a broad tool um, that you're putting in, you know, broad measurements. That's why it is only a tool. Now, if you did that, it might reduce the score by one percentage or two percentage points. But there are equally gains that come from that. There are some species where bare earth is actually important, which is why the metric has it in its condition assessments. So it's not always a negative. Um, but I cannot believe, having seen thousands of sites in my time, um, that you can't manage recreational pressure and achieve something of high biodiversity. Um, the woodland that's uh, to the north of our site um, has a number of public footpaths, permissive paths. It's an ancient woodland. Um, they're, they're things that ecologists have to deal with every single day. Um, so I don't see any conflict that would mean that the metric would substantially move in terms of the percentage. Thank you. Can I then please just deal with, um, yeah, I just want to, to ask you in relation to, um, in relation to this, and, and, and obviously in your proof, you make reference to other sites, et cetera. I mean, from your experience, how would you characterise? Let, let's just deal with this kind of overarching issue about likelihood, certainty, et cetera. In your experience, I mean, can I just ask you about what actually happens on the ground post-development once you get implementation and monitoring? What, what is your experience of what actually happens? So in terms of... Um you know, agreeing with the authority, the measures, I mean, that's going to be important in due course, but that can be dealt with by condition. But when um, work starts on site, the key areas, you know, can either be fenced off, there can be um, uh, briefings for the construction, you can have an ecologist clerk of works. There are all sorts of ways of dealing with construction. Um, you know, otherwise, how could you take roads through the middle of a triple S aisle? How could you do anything at all um, if there were no ways of controlling or managing that? So, again, I don't see any concern over the construction period. There will be, you know, a management plan, a construction management plan. Um, I think we've suggested a draft condition um, and that would deal with those measures. So again, I don't see the concerns. They're, they're just generic concerns that you could, you know, put at anybody's door or any application. Thank you. Could we then please, can we just move on and just briefly finish by dealing with Mr. Maysfield's questions that, that were put in? Can I just broadly ask you, I, I suppose, can I, in the light of the fact, I'm conscious of the time uh, and there are seven questions well, there are three questions raised. Can I just ask you broadly to summarise your response, Mr. May, uh, to Mr. Maysfield's questions, please, Mr. Goodwin? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, on the first one, um, let's deal with that because that's probably the most important one out of the three, or certainly from my point of view. Um, what he says there is um, that um, for the first time, I'd set out the EPR during an EPR bat survey. Well, it wasn't actually an EPR; it was one of our bat surveys. So we carried out a full Dormouse survey to the agreed methodology and protocol, and the result was negative. So not a single Dormice was recorded. But during a bat survey, one of the surveyors, out of the corner of their eye, thought they saw a Dormice entering a hole in a tree. And I think it was in group, group there's a group of trees, group G4, 40, G40. And so once again, I took the absolute precautionary basis, although the results told me it was negative, I took it, let's just say that they are there and let's deal with that as part of the process. So, um, so just to sort of correct that, it was actually 
our surveys, um, but they were negative in the proper survey and just a glimpse of something that someone thought was a dormouse. And I've been very, very precautionary about it. Um, but, but nothing turns on that. Um, hedgerows are very important, obviously. And you know the proposals are to boost those hedgerows, um, fill in the gaps, provide better habitat. Um, so even if we do have door mice, um, they're catered for as part of the enhancement proposals. Um, the, okay. second question, the second question is much the same. I mean, it's, it's talking about the importance of door mice. Yes, it's quite correct. You know, Schedule 5 of the Wildlife Countryside Act um, and, and so on. But I think I've explained it in the first part. And then number three um, was really, from what I can see, a criticism that um, Mr. White, your opening, has no <laughs> assets. I don't, it wasn't put that way. There's no harm to ecological assets, I think was the phrase you used, um, because I asked for that to be checked when I saw this last night. Um, again, it goes back to this survey information what is important and what isn't. And it isn't just about having some species on a list. Um, even if they're bat species, even if they're a red list species, a professional ecologist has got to interpret that as to how does that work in terms of the overall value. So I, I just agree with what he's trying to infer there. Because we've got some of these species, the site must be of you know, high importance. Well, no, it's not. Um, I hope that answers the questions, unless there's anything else that you think I've missed. Could I? No, that's fine. Could I then ask you to conclude, please? Could you just read out, re, read out 9.43, please, Mr Goodwin? Yep. Uh, in light of the above, I consider that the appeal proposals accord with relevant nature conservation objectives and are ahead of the curve in relation to current legislation national and local planning policy, and all relevant guidance in relation to nature conservation. As such, I can find no justifiable reasons for dismissing the appeal or rejecting the appeal proposals on the grounds of ecology and nature conservation. Thank you very much, Mr Goodwin. That's my examination chief, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'll do is I'll have, um, I'll have a brief adjournment and then uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Graham Paul can then uh, do the cross examination of Mr. Goodwin. But thank you for, for dealing with those matters. And uh, and so I'll adjourn for um, I'll adjourn until ten past three, just to stretch my legs and everything. <laughs> but anyway, so the inquiry is adjourned until ten past three.